Come on, church, would you please help me welcome all of our locations, our campuses, everyone watching online. We're so glad. So glad that you're with us today. We are in a series out of the book of the Song of Songs entitled In Love. And last uh, weekend, we talked about the art of attraction and that attraction is more than physical. In fact, the first attraction that you need to make sure that you have is a spiritual attraction. And the next attraction is an emotional or friendship attraction. And then the third one is the physical, and the physical will follow those two. There's lots of good-looking girls, lots of good-looking guys. It's so important that we understand that we are body, soul, and spirit. We're not just a body, and it takes that type of attraction, especially the spiritual, to really make a marriage work and have long-lasting romance. If you have your Bibles, I want you to just open them up to, once again, the Song of Songs. Just a reminder that a couple of weeks ago, we read through the Song of Songs in our daily Bible reading, and Solomon wrote this book, and this is called the Song of Solomon or the Song of Songs. It was actually uh, his, his top hit or his best-selling song, so to speak. He wrote about a thousand, uh, just over a thousand songs, a thousand and five songs. This was his number one hit. I think that we can all see why it deals with a subject matter that is, uh, that is very, very important to us as human beings. And on that note, I just want to remind everybody that God created sex. The devil did not create sex. God created sex. He didn't just create sex so we could procreate. He created sex so that we could have a powerful, pleasurable experience uh, within the context of marriage with a husband and wife. And we're going to unpack some of those things today. What I want to do is I want to begin reading in verse 4, I'm sorry, in chapter 4 in just a moment. I do want to remind everyone that next weekend we're going to have Jimmy Evans with us. We're having a marriage and family weekend. It's going to be absolutely awesome. Whether you're single, married, single, again, it doesn't matter where you are. You don't want to miss it. He's basically doing one of his relationship conferences here at our church. He usually does four sessions. He's going to combine them into two. Sunday morning is going to be different than Sunday night. It's going to be very, very powerful. Uh, I, unfortunately, I do need to remind you that next Sunday is also time change weekend. The bad time change where you lose an hour of sleep, so set your alarms and get up early, buddy boy, all right? It's gonna be a great, great weekend. And also, just to remind everyone, our, the downstairs portion of our loft is now open, the Loft Cafe. Come on, give God a big hand for that. And the upstairs will be open next weekend, which is about a 200 to 250 seat annex. And just wait till you're able to experience that. And that's going to be open uh, next weekend. So uh, here we go. We left off last Sunday in chapter 2, verse 7 where the woman and this guy, they're really, really in love, and they're kind of going through this uh, courtship, and, and, and she says not to awaken love before it's time, that, that there's a right context for sexual activity. And we need to understand that all sexual activity outside the context of marriage is going to be destructive. I want to be real, real clear about that. And, and, and many of you, many of us, we have been engaged in sexual activity, and, and whether it was before you were a Christian or, or even after you became a Christian, and you know, the world is just constantly pumping these messages to us, you know, about sex, and that it's, it's okay, and it's not a big deal, and just, you know, do it recreationally and all that. Our high schools, they're, 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 they're not teaching abstinence, wait until you get married. They're just teaching safe sex. Listen, there is no safe sex outside of marriage. And if we're going to enjoy sex the way God wants it to be enjoyed, we have to do it God's way. Right now, one out of every two couples ends up divorced. Right now, one out of every two couples will experience one or both parties in the relationship being unfaithful and having an affair. And I also want to remind you, listen, you're here today. Some of you, you have some regrets 
Some of you are, are, are in a place right now sexually and you're like, Stovall, man, you start talking about this God stuff and you, you don't understand, you know, what I'm going through. I'm living with this person and all this kind of stuff. Listen, God is not concerned about your yesterday. He's concerned about your today. Okay, I don't want anybody to feel condemned. I want everyone to know that you can have a new start in Jesus. You can have a fresh start in Christ. God loves you. God's for you. And he does not want you to destroy your life by engaging in sexual activity that is outside of his blessing because that is exactly what it'll do. Let me begin reading here in chapter four, just to tell you a little bit what's going on. So chapter two, the rest of chapter two, you know, they're kind of ooh la la, you know, dating and all that and turtle doves and all that kind of stuff. And then we get to chapter three and here's the wedding and oh, what a wedding it was. The, the, the groom had 60 groomsmen, man, and it was this big, big deal. And they're coming to this wedding. I want to remind you in, in biblical culture and Hebrew culture at this time, the wedding celebration lasted a week. How about that? How many of y'all like to go to a week-long party? It's just a whole, it's a week-long party. People would travel from all over the place and they'd finally get there. They'd set up tents and all that kind of stuff. That's why it was such a big deal in John chapter two when, when they, they ran out of wine at the wedding in Cana. It was only halfway through the week. It would have been a big offense to people if they had run out of, of food and drink and stuff like that. And they had traveled all that way to be part of this wedding. Another real interesting thing about Hebrew culture is at this time, they would not pronounce uh, the bride and groom husband and wife until the marriage was consummated. Okay, so literally, they would go and they would stand uh, before the priest and they would have this type of ceremony and then literally right then, they would walk People would be lining up on both sides. They would walk to what would, what would be the wedding chamber that many times was just like a tent set up, you know, out in the field. Aren't you glad we, we changed this tradition right here? <laughs> and, and so they would, they would literally walk to this tent and their friends would be lined up on either side going, woo, come on, come on, he's on tonight. It's a, cheering them on. They'd go in the tent. Everybody would be like waiting around. And then they'd come out of the tent and then everyone would cheer. They had consummated the marriage and the consummation is what had made them husband and wife. And so what we're looking at here in chapter four, this is that experience. This is that time. This is that night. Look what the man says. And it's interesting. He is going to be speaking for, there's 16 verses in this chapter. He talks for 15 of them. He talks for 15 of them. And he goes on to say, says, uh, you're beautiful, my darling, beautiful beyond words. Your eyes are like doves behind your veil. Your hair falls in waves like a flock of goats winding down the slopes of Gilead. Your teeth are white as opposed to yellow. Your teeth are white as sheep, recently shorn and freshly washed. Baby, your teeth are like a fresh washed sheep. <laughs> your smile is flawless, each tooth matched with its twin. <laughs> Baby, you got all your teeth, it's on tonight. <laughs> your lips are like scarlet ribbon, your mouth is inviting, your cheeks are like rosy pomegranates behind your veil. Your neck is as beautiful as the Tower of David, jeweled with the shields of a thousand heroes. Your breasts are like two fawns, twin fawns of a gazelle grazing among the lilies. <laughs> Before the dawn breezes blow and the night Shadows flee. I will hurry to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. You are altogether beautiful, my darling, beautiful in every way. I want to talk to you about great sex, real sex, and safe sex. Three things that the world is constantly pumping into our culture, but the way that they're pumping it into our culture is 
destructive. And I even think that there is a void because the church has not spoken enough about what the Bible has a lot about, and that is our sexuality and what is sex and how God intended sex to be. And so I've entitled this message appropriately and biblically out of chapter four, all night long. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. God, I just pray today, especially our young people, Lord, it just we live in such an hour in a culture where we are bombarded by the enemy with messages on sex and our sexuality. Lord, I just pray today, God, give us hungry hearts so we can hear and put into practice what you speak to us today. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen and amen.